So, with this thrust toward making the school safe, we can return to the skill streaming group itself and worry about its resistances and problems. And these are the types of problems that can occur in any intervention with youngsters, especially aggressive youngsters, including skill streaming. These are resistances of inactivity, hyperactivity, active resistance, aggression, and cognitive problems. And if you've been in the business of working with aggressive kids, even for half a year, you can probably put a kid's name after each one of these. This is not a workshop on behavior management, but obviously we're going to have to talk about it at least a little because the skill streaming agenda will not go forward if the group is not in good control. So what shall we do? Well, one of my suggestions, since you saw the resistance take place and what led up to it, make a guess about what its cause was. Maybe you can change the cause and therefore change the resistance. For example, maybe the youngster is acting in any one of those inappropriate ways because what you asked him or her to do is too complicated for them. If that's your guess, if that's your hypothesis or estimate, here in the context of skill streaming are ways of making the situation less complex. I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist here saying it's too complicated, make it simple. And if that works, resistance problem is solved. No, it's not that it's too complicated, you say to yourself, he or she did a more, even a more complicated role play last time. It's more that the kid is feeling threatened. I have to reduce the threat level of the group. And there are some ways of doing that. Now this particular overhead that shows you some ways of reducing the threat level in a skill streaming group gives me the opportunity to share with you what I think is your single most important role in running not only a skill streaming group, but any group. And that is the role of being a vigilant protector. These are kids who intimidate, who aggress, who behave in inappropriate ways, and you can be sure that no agenda, including skill streaming, will go forward if you lose control of the ability to protect the kids. What am I saying? Stephanie is role playing with Donna as the co-actor. First kid to role play, Stephanie. In the middle of the role play, Maura gives Stephanie an eat shit look. Christina sees it. Stephanie sits down with her role play. I say, Christina, would you get up and role play? Christina says, I'm not going to role play today. Now, I saw Maura do that also, and I didn't do anything. The fact that Christina is refusing to role play is my fault, not Christina's. Okay? We must make the hidden agenda open. And in fact, the very behavior Maura displayed in that critical look at Stephanie is the kind of behavior that made me want to invite her into the group in the first place. So this is a teaching opportunity. Maura, I saw when Stephanie did step three, you made a pretty strong face at her. Maybe we could give Stephanie in words that feedback about what you thought was not right on target. That would be really neat because she, that would help her. That teaches Maura something about how to be critical. Gives Stephanie the sense of the feedback, but most important for this example, reassures Christina that if someone is hypercritical of her, I will not let it pass. You must not let it pass. Okay? Must not let it pass. Be a vigilant protector. Then we come to the aggressive youngster, the youngster who behaves aggressively in the group. What is it we're going to do when the youngster behaves that way? Uh, one thing we can do for openers, simply, is to ask him to stop. Remember I said something earlier about Rob being up front leading the role play, and I'm the other trainer? Well, I would sit in the group, let's say it's Peter, who, with, next to the youngster, who in the past has acted up and acted out the most. Rob can get on with business, and I can sit next to Peter. And right on schedule, Peter starts making noises and being disruptive. I can quietly say to him, not disrupting myself, what Rob is doing, Peter, cut it out and pay attention. Peter doesn't cut it out. He escalates a little bit. Uh, I can say, Peter, remember what happened with you and Mr. Jones last week? This skill covers that situation. You really ought to pay attention. He doesn't. He's even more disruptive. I can get up, take Peter to the corner of the room, and ask him uh, in my own version of uh, attitude adjustment therapy to quiet down while the business goes on. If he's being really disruptive to the group, I will excuse him from the group that day. I won't get manipulated by the kid. But on the other hand, everyone's allowed to have a bad hair day now and then. 
and especially we're talking about kids who sometimes have difficulty in, in impulse control. Okay? Uh, I want to let him keep doing that. If he keeps doing that, even though he needs this group, if he's being disruptive to the other kids, I'll take him out of the group and put a different kid in. I've never had to do that uh, because I'd like him to stay in, but we have to sometimes opt for the greater good. What else can we do and should we not do? Well, I would certainly not respond in kind. I call it the friendly warning where you open your case, take out your mace, and put it close to their face. You know, we don't want to behave aggressively. And I also would not take off. Unfortunately, in those thousand incidents we gathered, there was one where there was a fight in the school cafeteria and two teachers locked themselves in the kitchen. I understand they don't want to get hurt, but we are the responsible adults. So I say no to flight management, not fight management, flight management, which I define as stopping what you're doing, listening to the yelling from a distance, and writing a memo to the principal. That's not appropriate. I also say not appropriate for cruel and unusual punishments, like one California school district where violators were held in an auditorium without television and they were forced to listen to classical music. We can't do that to kids. What should we do? What we should do is what we've learned from decades of research in behavior modification. We should start our groups, whether they're skill streaming or anything else, with a good set of rules. Classrooms should have them. Skill streaming groups should have them. Rules should be few in number. Half dozen is plenty. They should be negotiated with the students. What does that mean? It's not up to them. It'll be your rules. But if you can pull them from the students, they'll have some sense of ownership. Let me show you what I mean. I got lucky this term, ladies and gentlemen. This row here is my class for next term. Really bright students. I got a very good class. But you know why, kids? Even with bright students, there's a problem. Like, I'll ask a question, and maybe all of you will know the answer. How should we handle the situation? What do you guys think when lots of you know an answer to a, a question I ask? What do you think? Raise your hand, Mora's rule. You got that from now on? That's Mora's rule, raise your hand. And you can pull all of the rules from the kids just that way. State them behaviorally. Better to say raise your hand than be considerate. Let's be as specific as we can, concrete as we can. Better to be positive. Don't say, don't shout out. These are kids who've heard a million reprimands already. Let's tell them what they should do. Post them in the classroom and let's let the kids and the parents sign off. So we can do that. We can also punish kids. We can punish them by ignoring the behavior. If it's really low level, punish them in a sense by not giving them our attention. We can put them in time out. And I hope you will remember that time out is a few minutes in a quiet place. If the kid's five years old, five minutes, six years old, six minutes. Not a scary place. It's removing the kid from the reward of attention. If you're afraid that the kid will miss the lesson, Instead of exclusion timeout, where they actually go to a timeout room, you can have inclusion timeout, where they sit facing the wall, but they can hear the lesson, but not see the feedback in facial expression from their peers. Mm -hmm. However, whenever you use extinction, timeout, or response course, which is the manipulation of privileges, sanctions, grounding, is when parents do grounding, that's response course. Whenever you use any of those things, I urge you in the strongest possible terms to respond to the hundreds of studies of positive reinforcement that tell us probably the single best way to change any behavior. We know it, we believe it, but we hardly ever do it, and that is catch them being good. Catch them being good. John, you know you've been sitting here paying attention to my going on and on. I really want to thank you. Now, I bet you in this audience never in your life heard a member of an, a lecturer in an audience like this, workshop, lecture, anything, turn to a member of the audience in the middle of the lecture and thank them for paying attention. You never saw that. We don't do that. But if John stood up on his chair and started clucking like a chicken and I told him to sit down, you've seen that. We tell kids what not to do all the time. Why is it, do you think, that we're so reluctant as parents, teachers, supervisors, employers to... Catch them being good. You come into a classroom. In the corner of the room is Killer Kevin. Has the state record for in-school suspension. You know what, Kim, Sherry, you're not going to believe this. Kevin is reading the text. Kim says, shh, don't disturb him. We want to upset him. That's the mistake. That's the time to go to Kevin and say, Kevin, I see you're really into this work. Keep, up, keep it up. That's good. 
Johnny, you've been playing nicely with your sister for five milliseconds. Fantastic. <laughs> I made some videos once, uh, management training videos, that uh, one of which was called Rewarding the Average Employee. These were brief. And on this particular video, a foreman is shown going down his production line, saying to the workers, you know, Joyce, you come in every day, you do the job, you're a dependable person, I just want to thank you. That was basically the whole video. The foreman said, I ain't going to do that. Are you kidding? If I do that, they're going to say longer coffee breaks, more money, longer vacations. The heck with it. They're getting paid. Let them do the job. But it's not just foremen that are reluctant. We're all reluctant to do this, in spite of the fact that I know probably everyone in this room, I hope anyhow, on some occasions had, had someone say, good job. And we start working so hard for them because we love that little bit of praise. It's so rare. Our kids do also. I'm saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, the most aggressive kids you can think of, some of the time, if for no other reason than physical exhaustion, is not aggressive. That's the time to pay attention. That's the time to say, Johnny, good, good. You're on task. You're doing the job. I know he frustrated you. You stayed cool. Well done. Okay. So one of my favorite places for that is the school bus, since all kinds of mayhem goes on can go on in a school bus. And here, for example, is one combined list from a few different school districts of rules, school bus rules, nothing unusual here. These, most school districts have lists like this. Well, you know what? In one particular school district, if you follow these rules, you will get a good rider award. Now, just look at those awards. They're inexpensive. and yet mean an awful lot to the kids. Catch them being good. Kim, you've been paying attention to this workshop. I see you've been writing down what you think of as the key points. You haven't made noise. You haven't disturbed. When we had lunch a little while ago, you ate your whole meal. You ate your vegetables. <laughs> on and on and on. Okay, Catch them being good. The only other things I want to say about resistance uh, is twofold. First of all, you may have resistance because the kid is kind of shy. Uh, if I think Peter is a little shy about getting up to role play, uh, what I might do is, Kim and Sherry, would you get up and role play? Kim, you be the role player. Uh, Peter, would you mind coming along? I'm a little tired on my feet. Would you take the pointer? And as Kim and Sherry role play, would you just point to the steps? So I've gotten Peter up physically. He doesn't have to do anything. He just has to point to the steps. Okay? Kim now finishes role play. Sherry, why don't you stay up here? You be the main actor. Listen, Peter, as long as you're up here, you be the co-actor. You just respond. Now he's up here twice. And then I'll ask him to be the main actor. So sometimes you've got to ease kids into it. Sometimes it's a different kind of problem. And you may or may not know what's going on. Donna, would you get up and role play now? Donna said, uh-uh, I ain't getting up. Well, I'm in a group that's, I've announced the rules as everyone's got to do it. She's role played in the past. Well, you know, we have this rule, Donna, everyone's got to role play, so I really want you to come up. Donna says, I'm not coming up. Well, I'll tell you what, um, we're going to have to stick with this rule, but we don't have to go in a special order. Maura, would you come up? Maura role plays. Christina, you role play. Rob role play. Now there's no one left but Donna. Maybe the fact that the other kids got up will disinhibit her, and she will role play. Maybe not. If she does, fine. If she doesn't, uh, I'll have to say, listen, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm thinking to myself now, maybe something's going on in the group. That When I ask Donna why she doesn't want to role play, she doesn't want to tell me. So I'll say, I'll tell you what, would you kids mind go over there and do that exercise for her? Donna, stick around a minute. I can talk to her alone, okay? And maybe she'll tell me now. You see how important it again becomes the teacher-student, counselor-client relationship, whoever you are? If I've developed a good relationship with Donna, if she sees me as a vigilant protector, I'm much more likely to find out what's going on. If I can't find out, in spite of all these things I've done, and she still refuses, she's got to be out of the group. I've never had to do that. But you see what I'm saying? We all engage in triage. We can't have someone not role playing who is in the group. Okay? But if you approach it in, the, in a kind of empathic, caring, non-demanding way, I think you almost always get the, the proper response. Okay? Uh, I want to move on to 
a new topic called motivation. How are we going to motivate students to want to participate the way we hope they will in skill streaming? After all, for a great many students, behaving in an aggressive manner is uh, not a bad arrangement. Most acts of aggression, in fact, are not punished. And very often when there is a punishment, there's a long delay between the aggressive act and the punishment. The youngster doesn't make the connection. And many of the things that you and I conceive of as punishments are not experienced that way by the youngster. Okay. How are we going to motivate them to want to get involved in this and do what it is we're teaching them? Well, there's really only two types of motivators at our disposal, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic are things you give the kid. Intrinsic are things about the task itself. Let's look at extrinsic first. When the behavior modification movement first started and kids were given stuff for getting involved in programming, you know, cigarettes, M&Ms, and things like that, people used to say, well, you shouldn't do that. It's bribery. You don't hear that very much anymore, and I'm glad, because as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing wrong with paying a kid to be involved in programs. You get paid every day, not just because you want to help kids. You want to get paid. You work. You work hard. And you know what? We pay kids every day in every American classroom. We pay them points, checks, star stickers, which interestingly are negotiable for nothing in most schools, and the kids will kill for them nonetheless. In fact, it's the soon-to-be-famous Goldstein theory as to why middle school kids are so pissy, they finally figured out those stickers weren't worth anything <laughs> that you've been giving them all these years. So in delinquency centers, we have uh, movie privileges, uh, pizza parties uh, for kids who go through our aggression replacement program, which I'll describe to you shortly. We have a little graduation ceremony, and we give them an Anger Buster t-shirt. They like these these little t-shirts, huh? Well, all of this stuff is fine. All of this uh, material, tangible reward. But unfortunately, it will take you only so far. Eventually, the task itself has to pay off. How are we going to make the skills pay off? And we have what I think is a big time successful answer to that. We negotiate the curriculum with the kids. Remember I told you we want that checklist filled out not only by teacher, staff, and parent, but also by the kids? We want to know what skills they think they need to learn. If you were my skill streaming group and you came into the group for the first time, you would see up on the front something that looks just like this. Skill streaming skill checklist choices. It's a tally. Boys and girls, do you remember that checklist you filled out last week? Well, Rob and I have tallied your scores. Do you know what tally means? It means we've, we've figured out how many of you, by counting, chose each skill that you think you would like to learn. And it turns out that of you eight kids, six of you checked dealing with an accusation. So that's the one we're going to teach you first. Now, I bet you that's the first time in the kids' lives that they've been so empowered that they picked their own curriculum. So we teach that. Two, three weeks pass, time for a new skill, Rob and I pick it. Another two, three weeks pass, time for yet another skill, we'll let the kids pick it. How do we do that? Not hard. Listen, kids, uh, for today's skill, let's sort of pick it together based on what's going on in your life. Stephanie, how are things with you? Remember you had last week, you mentioned that trouble you were having with that boss in the grocery store, and Donna, you said something about you and your dad, and let's talk a little bit. Not to have a long counseling session, but five, ten minutes to find out about the intercurrent events in the kids' lives, and from that information, choose the skill. If, in fact, Donna and Stephanie were having trouble with people in authority, we would pick a skill that has to do with dealing with authority figures. Hmm? So if you look at the course of a skill streaming program, at this very end, you will see that approximately half the skills were picked by the kids and half were picked by the staff. Big time empowerment. This is not, this is not a, a, a very complicated step, but it's been very effective. All we're doing is giving the customer what the customer wants. If you go to a local store in this community and you buy a product, and you take it home, the price was right, it works well, when you need a similar product next time you go back to that store. That's all we're doing now. 
So when we've had research programs, training programs, where motivation, attendance, tardiness were a problem, the more we relied on negotiating the curriculum, the better it ran. Big time motivator. Nonetheless, even with doing that, I've still had a dozen kids say to me, and I quote, this shit won't work. So what do you mean it won't work? They say, come on, Goldstein, get out of that university and get, get out on the street more. We, can't, we can negotiate as much as you want in here. We can't negotiate out on the street. You've you got to hit the guy before he hits you. I say to the kid, now wait a second, what do you think we're doing here? We're not teaching substitutes, we're teaching alternatives. Kid says, I don't understand those words. I say, okay, let me give you, let me give you a sports example to help you understand. There's a team has one quarterback that's hurt bad and another one that's hurt enough, even though they've got to play him, he can't do the full range of things he does. He can't run very well, he can't throw far, but he's got a great short pass. So he's their quarterback. So he goes out one Sunday, and it's his, his first play. He throws a short pass, and because he's good at it, it's good. Goes out on the next down, throws another short pass. It's good again. But this time, the defense in the huddle say, hmm, two short passes out of two. Let's look for it. Third down, another short pass. They knock it down because they're looking for it. Third down, fourth down, another short pass. They intercept it. Son, you are like that quarterback. You have one play. It's your fist. Someone looks at you, you hit him. They don't look at you, you hit him. They talk to you, him. they don't talk to you, hit him. How about we help you be like that quarterback who has a variety of plays? So right now you've got a fist in every pocket. How about we keep the fist but only in one pocket? And I'll literally put my fist in my pocket. If you need to hit someone, I wish you wouldn't. I can't follow you around. I guess you're going to have to hit him. Uh, I'm not going to teach you how to hit. You're already better at that than I am. But that's a fist in only one pocket. In this back pocket here, a different play. Um, it's called negotiation. We'll teach you how to do it, and furthermore, we'll teach you when and where to do it. You know a quarterback in football gets something called a playbook? It has two things in it. It has the plays, like your fist, negotiation, whatever, but it also describes when and where and how in the game it should be used. So we'll not only teach you how to negotiate, but as a group, if Peggy, you're the kid, and you th think, well, you could learn how to negotiate, but you could never do it, I'll ask Joyce, I'll ask Patty and John, what do you think about times that anyone might be able to negotiate? And in the back pocket over here on the other side, a miracle play. You know why I call it a miracle play? Because once I describe it to you, you're going to tell me it's a miracle if you could do it. But I've seen kids do it. It's called walking away without losing face. Not an easy play, but once again, as a group, Rob and I will teach it to you, but as a group, we'll figure out when and where and with whom you can use that. And in the fourth pocket, yet another play. So what I've done here, ladies and gentlemen, is expanded the youth's behavioral repertoire. I told you at the beginning of the workshop, I'm in the business of small wins. I don't think that they'll do this all the time, and, and some of them won't even do it most of the time, but we've given them options now. That's what we're doing here in trying to motivate youngsters to use the skills that, in fact, we've been teaching them. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk about what I think of as the single most important topic in intervention work. It pertains not only to skill stream, but any intervention that you use with youngsters, aggressive or otherwise. It is the topic of generalization. Generalization. Generalization is of two types. One is called transfer. Will they take what they've learned and transfer it to new places? Another name for that is setting generalization. The second type of generalization is called maintenance. How long will the learning last? Another name for that is temporal generalization. So as far as setting generalization or transfer is concerned, just to use again the example of skill streaming, if you had your skill streaming group in the classroom, can they use the skill that you taught them when they get out into the hallway, in the schoolyard, and the street, new places? As far as maintenance or temporal generalization is concerned, you had your skill streaming session at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday. Can they still do the skill at noon? And how about Wednesday and next week and next month and next year? I have to tell you that when I was a graduate student in clinical psychology at Penn State many years ago, learning about different types of psychotherapy, all of the therapists who were developing their approaches, Freud, Adler, Jung, Horney, Sullivan, Rogers, they all in their own way said nothing about generalization. Their attitude was, if you go 
someone goes through my therapy, they'll be changed sufficiently that once they're cured, they're cured. It was a kind of medical inoculation view. Okay? Mora here wants to go on a vacation this winter to the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Lovely place. Unfortunately, they got a fair amount of malaria there. Mora doesn't want to get malaria. She goes to a public health officer, gets the medication she needs, takes it, goes to the Solomon Islands, gets bitten by the carrier, and doesn't get malaria because of what's circulating in her bloodstream. And we have acted as if our counseling and therapy and other interventions were similarly inoculations, giving the kids little MHs in their bloodstream for mental health. So they, the kid comes to us from an environment in which he learned to be aggressive. Then he comes to a second environment, us, and he changes for the better. We do good work, maybe skills training, maybe whatever you do. And then he goes away, and six months or a year later, we do something called follow-up, and we're disappointed that he's back in trouble again. Why shouldn't he be? We didn't give him an inoculation. People do respond to their environments. The social learning people are right. He's back in a criminogenic, neurotogenic, or otherwise troublesome environment. So it's not at all surprising that a great many of such youngsters recidivate, return to such behaviors. That's the bad news. The rest of my little talk on generalization is the good news because we are not powerless. In the last 15 years, a number of individuals, and I'm happy to include it among them, have been involved in research trying to develop strategies which enhance generalization, make transfer and maintenance more likely. And these strategies apply to any intervention. Some of you will do skill streaming, some of you will not. You'll do whatever you do. You need to pay attention to these strategies because they will help make your results transfer and last longer. The first strategy is called increase the quantity of the intervention. You got your foot in the door. He changed. Maybe all you need to do in this approach, which is probably the weakest of the four, but sometimes will work, is give more of what you were giving. Sometimes maybe all you need to do is increase the dosage, the level, the intensity of your intervention, not change the intervention, just give more of it. In skill streaming, we do that. In what we might call advanced skill streaming. For example, here's what's called a skill sequence of three skills. We've used this in the context of refusal skill training. When Nancy Reagan said, just say no, it was well-intentioned, but far too simple, given the peer pressure and other demands on kids to take substances of abuse. One thing they need, and even this won't be the whole story, but it'll help, is to learn how to say no. Well, sometimes when they say no, like in dealing with group pressure, they tell the group, no, I don't want that. It's not enough. The pressure continues or escalates. So they may need, following this strategy of increase the quantity, to learn how to use skill sequences where when one skill doesn't work, they go to a backup skill, like responding to failure, and they go through its steps, which leads them, notice the last step is try again using your new idea, to yet a third skill, in this case, standing up for your rights. There are many such skill sequences, but I'm using this as an example of I call it advanced skill streaming, but it's an example of the, of the generalization strategy to increase the quantity of what you're doing. That may solve the dilemma. That's the first strategy. The second strategy is to increase the quality of the intervention. Now, I'm still talking about you and the youngster. I haven't yet reached beyond you and them to involve other people. What are the things you can do to facilitate generalization, let's look at transfer first, by doing things in that training room or in that classroom differently. You can provide, number one, the youngster with the general principles involved in what you're doing. The real world and the role play world are never identical. The person has to adapt what they're doing at least a little bit. So if they understand the principles underlying the situation where the role play is going to take place and the skill itself, they can twist and turn the steps to fit the situation. Overlearning. I want to focus on overlearning because it has worked especially well for us in our work. And maybe a good way to focus on overlearning is to show you uh, a particularly relevant cartoon. Uh, one day, uh, 
uh, Tarzan was in the jungle, and he heard that there was someone else there named Jane. He had never met Jane. He wanted to meet Jane. So he is swinging through the jungle, rehearsing the skill, introducing yourself. And as a good skill learner, just as we do with the kids, we ask that the skill learner practice alternatives before picking one. That's what Tarzan is doing. And here he is. He says, okay, how do you do? And he's talking to himself now. My name is Tarzan. I believe you are known as Jane. That's his first rehearsal. Here's his second. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. A <laughs> little arrogant, but nonetheless, uh, another alternative, huh? Here's the third one. He says to himself, you must be Jane. I am Tarzan. It's a pleasure to meet you. And there she is. He's ready, right? He's got three different ways to introduce himself. What does Tarzan say? He says, me Tarzan, you Jane. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> what happened to Tarzan, anybody? He what? Froze. He froze. Social anxiety. Performance anxiety. So I'm a delinquent kid in the facility. I'm about to get out. And here's my last role play before I'm released. Two other kids are locked up with me, and they're helping me practice something I need to know back out on the street to deal with group pressure. They pretend they just pulled up in a brand new BMW. My friends, they're pretending they're my friends from back out on the street. Hey, Arnie, says John, how you doing? I said, I'm fine. Hey, Patty says, yeah, good to see you. Get in the car, we'll go cruising. And I give him this whole story about, well, I, you know, I don't think it's your car. You're 15 years old, and it's a $30,000 car and all of that stuff. Where are you guys going? Patty says, we're going to the park. I say, where? John says, parking lot D. I say, oh, listen, I'll walk over. About 20 minutes, I'll meet you there. They say, great, we'll catch up. That was a good role play. I resisted their pressure. I didn't get in trouble. The trainers make it my homework. Now I'm out on the street. And here's Shirley and Michelle, two real thugs who are really friends of mine. They pull up in a brand new BMW. I'm thinking to myself, I'm ready for this. This is the very thing I rehearsed back in the facility. Michelle says, get in, come on. And Shirley says, yeah, we'll go cruising. And I give them the whole thing. The food wasn't good back there. I don't think so. Where are you going? They say, parking lot D. I say, I'll walk over. And Michelle says, well, chicken shit, if that's the way you're going to be, you go that way and we'll go this way. Just like Tarzan, the anxiety level goes up. Don't want to lose their friendship. I get back in the car. I get back in trouble. So we can't just be concerned about teaching the skill. We have to be concerned about helping the kid overcome that anxiety. There was once an actor who had never had a speaking part. He finally got a speaking part. One line. Hark, I hear a cannon. It was a month before the show was going to open. For a month, he rehearsed that line. Hark, I hear a cannon. So he could say it just right. You never know who's in the audience. Finally, it's opening night. It's his moment. He's on stage. There's a loud boom. And he says, what the hell was that noise? <laughs> He knew the line, but he, because of the anxiety, okay? Overlearning helps overcome that anxiety. That's the, that's the point. Overlearning helps overcome that anxiety, and overlearning is the practice of perfect. Not practice makes perfect. And practice makes perfect. You do it till you get it right, and then you go on to the next. We don't do that. Trisha, that was a good role play. Can you do it again? Trisha says, how come I got to do it again? You, you and Rob all said it was good. Well, let's get two for two. Let's get three for three. We want to overlearn it. Why do we want to do that? The kids have already overlearned how to be aggressive. It's a response up here. It's ready to go. Someone gets in their face, boom, in a split second. Now you teach them an alternative. They learned it, but it's down here in terms of readiness to use, prepotency. We want to make it more of a horse race. So have two rounds, three rounds, four rounds of role playing. If they complain, there are worse things in life about being a little repetitious. If they complain a lot, go on to the next skill, come back to this one. When a teacher in my practicum tells me it's the 15th week of the term and I'm up to my 11th skill already, I say, what does up to mean? The point of going through a curriculum, whether it's English, social studies, or social skills, is not to get through the curriculum. The point is for the person to retain it. I'd rather she told me she's up to the fourth or fifth skill. Don't run through it. Pick the skills that, pick the skills that work and help them really overlearn them so that when they're facing Jane, when they're facing the audience, when they're facing the peer group, they will have available what it is you've taught them. If you're going to do that, 
follow the principle of stimulus variability, which means that they role play with different people each time. The greater the variety of people with whom you role play, the more likely there will be qualities of those people that overlap with the person you really need to, to use the skill with. Identical elements is, is another principle of transfer, the oldest one, 1901, from the work of Thorndike. The greater the similarity between the training setting and the application setting, the easier it is. When we had, who was it, Donna, be the surrogate mama in that earlier role play, we said, make believe this is the sink. We said, what is it like? How does your mama talk? What's the kitchen like? How can we arrange it? What time of day? To maximize the similarity between the training and the real world. Okay? A lot of people do that. The marriage therapists do that. Here's poor Joyce having marital problems. I'm a marriage therapist. What should I do? Work with her for a year till she knows how to make her marriage better and then say, now you go home to your husband Fang and teach him these things. <laughs> better, get Joyce, better get Joyce and Fang to come in together. So when I go into a school, I want a group of eight kids. I'll take all eight of them from one class rather than one each from eight different classes. When I go to a delinquency center or a residential center, uh, the people live together, crews, cottages, units, teams. That's the group. I do gang work. I bring the gang in as a whole. Most people who do gang research say, don't do that. If you work with the gang as a unit, by the very act of doing that, you are making the gang more credible. And it's right. It's a mistake. But I think there's something more important. And that is to work with the people who matter in the people's lives. Why should I train this gang kid to do one thing and not her gang homegirl? Huh? The second Kim goes out, the homegirl says, don't do that stuff, it's baloney. Well, that's crazy, it's wasting my time. I want the homegirl in there, I want the whole gang in there. Okay? That's how we do it. That's that principle, identical elements. And the final principle that helps transfer has to do with mediated generalization. That's, all that means is the individual can be his own transfer agent, teach him how to keep track of how well he's doing, praise himself if he's doing well, sanction himself if he's doing poorly. The last thing on this list, sequential modification, is a way that you'll see in a moment of training the other people in the kid's life to also be trainers. We're going to look at that now as we move in a little bit to the role of other people. Before we do, I just want to say about maintenance. Maintenance. Remember, transfer was one thing. Maintenance is how long it lasts. All of the things on this overhead have to do with reward or reinforcement. Having the right kind of schedule of reward or reinforcement in terms of richness and frequency and timing and nature all will facilitate longer lasting responses. With regard to skill streaming, there are a couple of things that are particularly important. One of them is to teach reinforcement recruitment, teach reinforcement recognition. Some of the kids don't know what a reward is. They know what a punishment is. Sometimes you have to actually teach kids how to recognize praise. Listen, you kids, you know, I'm glad that you're in my class this term, and I have lots of ways to let you know when you do the good work I'm gonna, I know you're going to do. I can go thumbs up. I can go like this. I can go nice job, well done, keep going, good work. I'm going to use all those things to let you know how you're doing because I know you're going to do well. That's one way. Another way, another way of, gen of enhancing the generalization in terms of maintenance teach reinforcement recruitment. Sometimes the kids do know what a reward is, but the teacher or youth care worker is so stingy in giving it out, you have to teach the kids how to pull it out. Mrs. Smith, that essay I wrote, did you like it? I spent a lot of, could you, could you hear me in the choir? I was really trying to belt out that song. That picture with the pastels, that was mine. I spent, did you like it? Because I liked it. You have to sometimes pull that. The final one is, is useful in our transition to the next strategy. I call it use graduated homework assignments. This is our way of getting the kids' system involved. For example, we, we don't want to give a homework where the skill is done well, but the kid doesn't get praised for it, do we? Okay. Amy, we're doing the skill persuading others. Amy is the, is the role player. Amy, who would you like to persuade to do something differently? Amy says, well, I don't know. You know, I got this strange curfew at home. Uh, my dad makes me come in at 8.30. Um, here I am, 30 years old. I like to stay out as late as, as my friends. 
Okay, let's, let's do that. Who in the room reminds you most of your dad? She picks Sherwin. They get into the role play. She tries to persuade the surrogate dad, Sherwin, to let her have a curfew as late as her friends. And at the end of the role play, Sherwin says, you've convinced me, honey. You can stay out as late as your friends. Well, it looked like that role play worked, so we all agreed to make that Amy's homework. I turn to Amy. I say, what do you think, Amy? You want to do that for your homework? Amy says, well, look, I'm glad Sherwin would let me stay out later. Uh, but as we're going through this role play, I was remembering just last week, my sister asked my father for something I thought was pretty reasonable, and he told her to screw off. And I'm afraid even if I ask him in this good way, you don't know that guy. He might make me come in earlier. Well, we don't care about Amy's curfew. The goal of skill streaming is not to help Amy stay out later. The goal of skill streaming is to add the skill to her repertoire so that in general, she has it available. I would say, Amy, hold off on that homework. Um, didn't you say that you and your sister get along pretty well, but uh, uh, sometimes she doesn't use your tape deck the way you want? Persuade her. Same steps. Persuade her to do what you want with that tape deck. And last week you mentioned this neighbor of yours, Freddie. Wasn't that his name? Yeah, Freddie. You said he was a, a friend of yours, but sometimes he blocks the alley with his motorcycle. You can't get your bike out of the garage. Same steps to get him to move the motorcycle. Then go to your father about the curfew so that if it works with the sister, it works with the neighbor and fails with the father, it's less fragile. It's more likely to persist. That's the goal here. Which brings us then to the role of other people in this effort at generalization. That is the kid's system. What we want in this third strategy is two things. We want system support. That is, we want them to reward the skill when it's done well. And also, we, some skills, we want reciprocity in the sense that some skills don't make sense if someone doesn't do it back to you. No sense teaching someone how to negotiate if no one negotiates back. So we need to reach out to the kid's system. And who is that? Well, it's a variety of people. Here's a, here's a list, uh, one possible list. Basically, it's a list of the important people in the kid's life. In particular, parents and peers, but it could be other people also. It would be nice if these people were part of the team. Unfortunately, too often, they're part of the other team, if you know what I mean. Sometimes, let's stay with the parents for a moment, they deny that there's a problem. I saw a political cartoon where a kid is in the back of a police car, and the police officer says, is talking to the mother. And, and the officer says, your son took hostages, shot an officer, ruined a police car, and on and on and on and on and on. And the mama says, is that any reason to treat him like a common criminal? No. It's easy for mamas and papas to deny that their little angel is, is a problem. I also saw some data making even more of a concern um, comparing fighters and non-fighters in New York City schools. 80% of the kids who are chronic fighters believe, no doubt correctly, that their parents want them to hit back. So it's not only that the parent might deny that there's a problem, but the parent might be paddling the canoe in exactly the opposite direction that you want. The goal then is really to build a homeschool collaboration, a team. And there are barriers to that collaboration, some of which come from the school, some of which come from the parents. The ones that come from the school, I like to summarize by pointing out that too often the school takes a bake sale attitude basically tells the parent, all we want from you in a literal or figurative bake sale is back us up for our decisions, because we're the educators, all you are as the parent. Ignoring the fact that the parents were the kid's first educators, still know an awful lot about what the kid knows and doesn't know, we're trying to build a team, a partnership. So the attitude of the school needs to be a respectful listening to of the parents, especially because so often these are parents whose own experience, personal experience with school, was not such a good one. And so often their experience with their kid in your school is the only time they heard from you is the bad news call. Hmm? Sometimes the dilemmas come from, the difficulties, the barriers come from the parents, especially low-income parents. We're in a funny phase in America now where if you're poor, you're bad, you're lazy, and you deserve it. I wish we could flip that over and be admiring of how much poor people can often do with so few resources on their plates. But nonetheless, very often because of time, job, transportation constraints, it's hard for the parent to become part of a homeschool collaboration. 
cultural backgrounds may differ and so forth. And this, this uh, difficulty in collaboration becomes even worse if the family comes from a recently arrived uh, immigrant family from another country. There are limitations to that. So we ought to reach out. We ought to reach out. We ought to do what many schools do, a newsletter, letters home from, from individual teachers. Here's a sample letter at the middle school level. This, uh, this teacher says, Dear Mrs. Smith, I'm Susan Stripley, Jason's social studies teacher. I want to welcome you and your son Jason to my class for this school year. I'm looking forward to a great year and I hope Jason is also. Social studies this year is mandated by the state of New York. We'll cover American history from the founding to the present. We've got a lot to cover. We're moving fairly fast, so I hope that Jason will make every effort to keep up. If at any time he's having a problem, he need to see me right away so he can be sure he doesn't fall behind. I'm usually available now. I hope you're listening as if you were the parent receiving this a week before school starts. Powerful message to get. I'm usually available every day after school for extra help. He should check with me in class to be sure I don't have a school meeting on the day he plans to come. Then there's a paragraph on classroom rules, one on procedures, one on homework and quizzes. And the letter ends, Mrs. Smith, one of the most important things which will contribute to Jason's having a successful year in social studies is for you and I to stay in close contact about what's going on in school and what's going on at home. Please call me with any concerns you have. You can reach me at the school. Is the phone number, da da dum During the school day, please leave a message, and I'll get back to you that afternoon after the students leave or that evening from home. I'm looking forward to meeting you soon and having a great year with Jason. So three weeks later, when Jason throws uh, a chair through the window and you have to make the bad news call, it's not the first call. At least there's the beginnings of a relationship. I know teachers are busier than heck. And there's tons of things to do. The effort to reach out to parents before there's a crisis will be greatly rewarded in all kinds of ways, including less trouble for you, the teacher. Uh, in skill streaming, we try to facilitate that. With every skill we teach, we send a note home, a school home note, filled out by the kid. Name of the skill, write down the steps. Even if it's on your skill card, copy it. One more learning experience. Tell mama and papa what the purpose of the skill is and its value and describe the homework. And often as not, the homework target is the parent. Hmm? Then we want the parent to respond. Reward the homework if it's done well. Reciprocate if it's a skill requiring reciprocation. And please return the note with comments about the quality of the homework done, what rewards work, and any other suggestions. Let's get a dialogue going. Let's not just send home notes that are one-way communications to the parent. We're trying to build a team. Who else is in the kid's system besides the parents that's relevant to the education effort? Who else is in schools? Well, there's administrators and there's teachers. I've gone through the relevant educational research literature. These are qualities of school administration associated with low levels of aggression. You can scan that. I'm not going to go over all of it, although I sure have a couple of favorites. One is principal visibility and availability. Do you folks know, and this may amaze you, that five out of every six secondary schools in America have 2,500 students or more? And with all the metal detector scanning we're going on, what is welcome to the day? Welcome to the school day for youngsters is a huge number of kids parading through a metal detector. Now compare that to what might go on in a more optimally sized school, in the school size literature that's usually discussed as six to 800 students. I'm the principal, and the day is beginning. Hi, Shirley, good morning to you. Listen, how's your leg, dear? Because you know, we need you on that track team. I saw what happened when you fell down last time. Take care of yourself. Michelle, you're the new girl. Welcome to the school. I was looking at your records, and you need a little math tutoring. My secretary's name is Helen. I've arranged for it. You go see her, and we'll set you up. Mira, how you doing? How's your mama feeling? I hear she was feeling poorly. Can't do that when you have three, 4,000 kids. Think of what a lovely way to begin the day. huh? The other thing I like to point to is effective intelligence network, not meaning a spy system, but meaning a communication system where people know what's going on they t because they talk to each other. In too many American schools and institutions in this era of shared decision making, Shared decision-making plays out with the boss making the decision and sharing it with everybody. That's not shared decision-making. Shared decision-making means communication up the ladder, not just down the ladder. Uh, so that's another one I like to point to. 
What about teachers? Teacher qualities in low aggression schools. Some are causes, some are correlates. And ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, I have a huge favorite on this list. It's number five, consistently optimistic academic expectations. Christina and I are both fourth grade reading teachers and we're friends. It's a week before school starts and I bump into her in the teacher lounge. Hey Christina, how you doing dear? Listen, I hate to start your year this way, but I got some bad news for you. I was down by the office, I got my class list, I looked at yours, you have Billy Jones. Whoa. I had his brother Bobby last year. You know, I, you remember how I kept telling you how hard I was working to get him up to level. He's still at level two. Don't kill yourself with his brother Billy. Must be the family gene pool or something. You got other kids to worry about. Having set her expectancies for the kid's failure, I've contributed to the kid's failure. It's not the only thing, obviously. We don't want to overstate the power of expectancy, but we sure don't want to understate it. They are important. That's the bad news. The good news is, Optimistic expectancies can drive toward higher performance levels. We need to expect the best of people. We will often get it. The very best agency in which I've ever worked was in the most crime-ridden section of Brooklyn. And why was it the best? Because these kids were told by the staff, look, we come in early, we stay late. All of us on the staff, we're not stupid. We're not going to invest our energy in youngsters who can't succeed can't stay out of trouble, can't get, a, you can succeed, you can get, get your GED, you can get along with your mom. We're willing to put the energy and effort in, we expect you to do the same thing. Kids will live up to that. Is this not something that some of you have personally experienced? I almost failed out of the City College of New York. This is not a tale, this is true. I had nine toes out the door as a sophomore. Mm -hmm. And a math professor, of all things, I'm not the world's best mathematician, came to me and said, you don't have to leave. I turned around to see who he was talking to. He was talking to me. He said, speaking of himself, I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm a competent math professor. I know you can do well. I'm willing, he said, again, speaking of himself, to work hard to help you with this. I expect you to do that. I worked so hard for him. I did fine, and I did fine after that. People, will, I'm saying to you, I know that the teaching profession, youth care profession, can often be very frustrating and sometimes non-rewarding, but you can be the single most important thing that ever happens in a child's life. It may not happen often, but it can happen. One way to help that happen is to expect the best of them. You may get it. Unfortunately, in addition to expecting the best and making aggression less likely, teachers and others who work with aggressive kids can behave in ways that make it more likely. Teachers as violence enablers. These are the things that staff, well-intentioned staff can do that unfortunately causes violence to become more likely. And you notice how many of these are inattention to low-level violence. It gets back to that point I made. It's talking about rumors and threats and bullying. So it's not only that I understand you need to protect yourself, but we are the responsible adults and we have to behave that way. The more that we join together to do this, to avoid enabling violence, the less there'll be a problem for all of us. Finally in the kids system is unauthorized persons. Here are some things that schools are doing to keep out unauthorized persons. There are three types of unauthorized persons about whom schools are concerned. One is people who never went to the school. They don't belong there. They may or may not be rival gang members, but they need to be taken care of, keep kept out. Another is kids who did go to the school, but they no longer go there. They either graduated or dropped out. And the most difficult unauthorized persons to deal with are so-called internal dropouts. Kids who still are on the books. They sign in if there's a homeroom in the morning, but they don't go to class. That's why some schools are increasingly having kids carry student ID cards and check in for each class.